So hi, Joseph, it's very nice to meet you here. Thanks for being here with us. Tell us please a little bit about the story behind Ethereum. In around 2012, um, things were gaining momentum and lots of different people around the world in the Bitcoin space started thinking, hey, this is an amazing uh, database technology breakthrough. Not only does it enable people to uh, be incentivized to share their resources, to validate transactions and secure a network, but it provides this trust layer that we've never had before. So a uh, radically decentralized trust layer uh, so that people could interact with one another, or transact with one another uh, if they were competing. Um, or if they didn't even know one another and, and still have full trust in those transactions. Uh, so um, Bitcoin contemplated that sort of thing only for money, basically, uh, cryptocurrency. And lots of people in 2012 felt, hey, we should be using this for all of our software systems. And so um, different things were tried, uh, colored coins, uh, meta protocols, other blockchain systems. Vitalik Buterin was working on, he might be right down there, uh, he's somewhere somewhere in the vicinity. He was working on a few different, uh, uh, they were called Bitcoin 2.0 projects. Uh, they later evolved to be called blockchain projects, um, but he was working on Bitcoin 2.0 and came up with the description uh, for the Ethereum platform that was essentially the most elegant, most powerful description of a blockchain platform up to that point. Um, it uh, contemplated having a computationally complete virtual machine uh, at every node of a peer-to-peer -peer network, separating the protocol layer from the application layer. Uh, in Bitcoin up to that point, uh, there was no separation of application from protocol, really. If you wanted to build some new app into Bitcoin or into another blockchain system, you had to do it at the protocol level. You needed a protocol priest to figure out how to fiddle a bunch of bits and architect things and create a new operation code um, in there, and then you'd have to create some user interface for it. So separating the protocol layer from the application layer enabled essentially millions of software engineers to not worry too much about what's going on at the protocol layer um, and just build with tools similar to what they're used to using when building web applications and mobile applications and identify their own problem uh, and uh, build their own solution. And that ended up working out pretty well because the Ethereum application layer developer base is about 40 times larger currently, according to Gartner, uh, than the number two blockchain system, which is IBM's Fabric. And how did you meet Vitalik? How did you decide to find So the I'm from Toronto. Vitalik's from Toronto. I was home in uh, December 2013, uh, visiting family over um, the Christmas break and met Vitalik about a month after he wrote the white paper describing Ethereum. Uh, talked for a while that day. I read the white paper that night and stayed close to the growing group of people that was excited about the project. And a few weeks later, we all uh, got a house together in Miami and structured the project. A couple days later, we were basically there for the North American Bitcoin conference uh, in Miami. and. Uh, Vitalik was scheduled to deliver the Ethereum paper that he'd written. First phase of the project was structured there. What was the most challenging time for the Ethereum network so far? I think there are lots of challenging times for the project. Um, so it's, it was unprecedented. Many people said it couldn't be done. Many people said it was stupid to do it because the attack service would be uh, so big and, and fuzzy and um, it's turned out um, to be a remarkable success, in my opinion, and it's still very immature, it's still very young. Uh, we uh, are in kind of phase one of the blockchain space still, where we have as these networks where uh, you know, all the full nodes basically have to hold all the data and, and process all the transactions. Um, we're just moving for Ethereum into phase two, where we keep that not very scalable, uh, radically decentralized trust layer. Um, we add a layer two for scaling mm -hmm. on top of that so that uh, uh, we can have 20 transactions per second in this trust layer, uh, but we can have hundreds or thousands of transactions per second in state channels or side chains uh, at layer two. And so that's available now. Lots of projects are building 
uh, that out. Some projects are released already using state channels and plasmas available, different sidechain mechanisms are available. If there have been uh, difficult times for the Ethereum project, uh, let's, let's say technically difficult times, uh, it's absolutely necessary. Um, the, the internet protocols evolved, the web protocols evolved uh, because software developers were pushing on them. Um, uh, for decades, we've had scalability concerns in, yeah. in information technology, and so we need uh, to keep throwing too much at the network uh, so that we know exactly uh, where the weak spots are, where the bottlenecks are, and how to architect things uh, so they can handle uh, bigger, better applications. There are a lot of projects right now that move from Ethereum network to create their own, like Tron, for instance. Yeah. What does it mean for Ethereum? Well, I guess it establishes Ethereum as a, a great uh, birthing or launching ground for a whole lot of projects that are exploring the solution space, and I, th I think that's really valuable. Uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is orders of magnitude larger than other ecosystems, and uh, the mechanism is, is much more expressive, much more powerful than uh, any other blockchain out there right now. Um, the Ethereum set of teams, the many set of teams that uh, work at the protocol layer um, are very open and agile and have demonstrated that they can take technologies like ring signatures or ZK snarks that are um, developed elsewhere and move them into Ethereum as, as uh, it makes sense. So uh, I think there should be many different projects in our ecosystem. Uh, exploring how to do things and it doesn't need to be on Ethereum, uh, but we're paying attention. What about the recent SEC hearing establishing the Ethereum as not a security? So it wasn't a hearing. Bill Hinman just delivering a, a talk at a San Francisco event. Yeah. And so how did you feel about that? Where you feel uh, stressed about what's, what might happen if, if it were established as a security? We were extremely confident that it would never be seen to be a security. We did a huge amount of legal work, about seven months of legal work, um, back in 2014 before uh, we launched um, the Ether token launch. Um, so we're confident that it never was a security. The sale did not constitute the sale of a, an unregistered security to Americans, and we're confident that the Ether token uh, has never been a security. Um, we understood the ramifications. Uh, if they de declared it a token, then uh, there'd be some issues around where the Ether token could trade, but the, mm -hmm. the ecosystem's already so enormous, established, decentralized, that you can't really stop that sort of thing. Uh, there would have had to have been some adjustments. Um, but we also been talking to regulators around the world for a long time, um, and the SEC knows what they're talking about. We were. Um, confident that they would understand how we test maps onto uh, this particular instrument and uh, how the nature of the decentralized ecosystem ramifies on, on their decisions. And so uh, what was even more exciting uh, about what Director Hinman said uh, was that he, uh, I think they sort of consider Ether to be in a new class of tokens, consumer utility tokens, uh, that uh, essentially enable this new networked business model um, to be pioneered, so a different way of humans organizing for collective commercial action uh, where I'm not necessarily um, making an investment and relying on a third party um, to increase the value of my investment. I am buying something, a utility, uh, and participating in a network of activity, I'm adding value to that network of activity, and uh, if we together create these protoc this protocol-based open platform, and we're building a whole lot of those things at our company consensus, um, and it uh, is held together logically by a token that you know has certain characteristics on that platform, none of which constitutes securities, um, uh, then. Uh, if that token, or, or if the network itself uh, gets utilized heavily, uh, then supply and demand will cause that network to become much more valuable. So if we're all contributing in our different roles to that network business model, we can all make it more valuable together. So if it's transferred into this consumer network, right, and if it's an asset of consumer utility, 
that you said, the new asset, should it be also regulated or just you feel like the regulator is not really sure about how to approach this new type of so asset? So it is regulated in a sense. Um, it is, there are laws in lots of countries. Uh, there are money transmission laws, KYC, AML. Um, uh, <laughs> this kind of activity uh, does not currently um, fall under any uh, specific detailed uh, requirement uh, for regulation or guidance. And, and so um, unless it's operating, say, in the pharmaceutical industry or something like that, uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason to regulate it uh, any more than you would regulate a, uh, a bowling club or something like that. What about consensus? Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about consensus? What does the company do? What's your role in it? So consensus uh, was started about three and a half years ago, mm -hmm. one year into the Ethereum project. Uh, we're getting to the point where it looked like we were going to uh, release version one of the platform, but there weren't a lot of people building applications. So we started it uh, to start building applications. Uh, we started building a few applications. We realized it was hard to build applications with no developer tools mm -hmm. for a platform that wasn't really yet released in an ecosystem that didn't exist. and. Um, we started building those developer tools. We started building infrastructure to support applications, things like MetaMask and Infura, which currently handles about 8 billion queries per day uh, from the uh, public Ethereum and IPFS systems. Um, so Ethereum is a network that handles somewhere between 800,000 and a million transactions a day currently. That's about 80% of all the transactions in the blockchain space. Um, but those are writes against the database, so transactions change some sort of data on the blockchain. Uh, but there's so many applications that read data and do logging events and other kinds of queries on the data, uh, and you don't have to do a transaction uh, for those things. So that's how you get from, uh, say, one million to about eight billion. Um, and um, so we built that infrastructure. We uh, build other products like uh, Uport self-sovereign identity and reputation systems and accounting systems and governance tools. Uh, and we build many of these protocol-based open platforms. Um, uh, so in the adjacent music industry, in, in longitudinal health data, um, in a bounties network, and so lo lots of these things that are essentially, they're not all running with the token right now, but they're all moving towards um, basically defining a protocol um, and turning it into an open platform so lots of businesses can operate uh, on, these, uh, on these platforms. So that's the product side of the company. Mm -hmm. We also do enterprise and government consulting. It's nearly all on Ethereum. Uh, so we do a huge amount of Ethereum focused work for the public blockchain ecosystem. But we, we use the exact same technology in work with corporations. We've done work in energy, uh, banking, insurance, healthcare, supply chain, and education, and lots of work with government as well. So a couple different central banks and um, Zug, where we are right now. Uh, our, our identity uh, system, Uport, is being used for, um, for citizens to access government services and uh, to vote in plebiscites. Um, and uh, done a bunch of work in Dubai in the Smart Dubai Smart City project and land registry work. And um, uh, we sort of manager of the European Union Blockchain Observatory, uh, where we're interacting with lots of member nations and uh, helping uh, drive thought leadership uh, there. Um, and uh, um, our education group, Consensus Academy, uh, we've graduated 120 blockchain engineers and a bunch of lawyers in a continuing legal education course, other kinds of learners from different institutions. Uh, we currently have about 800 people uh, in an online cohort right now and another 100 or 200 people in a course based in India right now. So we're And on the capital market side, um, we have a group uh, that's building uh, a foundational layer for custody. Uh, so uh, custody of value tokens uh, is essentially the big issue that's holding a bunch of uh, serious legacy world financial institutions from jumping heavily into this space. They need a really good narrative around uh, how their value tokens are, are being stored. Are you uh, consulting them or? So we're, we're building a, a product. Uh, so uh, some people from 
sophisticated banks, some of them organized in this country, Switzerland, um, and some organized in America. And um, they, it's an outstanding team, and uh, we think we're going to have a, a breakthrough product uh, for custody uh, that can serve as the foundation for lots of things. You can build exchanges on top of that. We're um, working on that sort of thing. Uh, we have a group called Token Foundry. Uh, so we've done token launches of investor tokens, securities. Uh, we've done token launches of consumer utility tokens. Um, and we are um, beefing up our ability to do a lot of both of those. Uh, and so we've actually pioneered this notion of a, um, a technologically accredited token buyer. Uh, so that uh, essentially Director Hinman in, in that, uh, uh, that talk that he gave, um, uh, he pretty much indicated that um, if you architect your token correctly and you market it correctly, uh, then it would not be seen by the SEC to be a security, and, and every situation is different. Um, so we can architect it correctly, but if you take a well-architected token and then you um, sell it in huge quantities to investor types at discounts and you put billboards up in Times Square and... Um, All over Facebook. And exactly. Uh, so that might be seen uh, to be uh, an investment. Uh, if, if people are led to believe that they're going to uh, uh, have their purchase uh, grown in mon monetary value by the agency of others, uh, then that could be uh, considered a security. So um, we have this infrastructure that uh, will ensure that we're not selling tokens or, or the different projects aren't selling tokens uh, in excess quantities to investor types. Uh, you're gonna have to know the technical details of how to use the tokens. You may have to pledge that you are using the tokens. Tokens may not even be tradable until you've actually used them on the platform. So we've built that infrastructure. If you want to fund your own company, is an initial coin offering the best way to do that, in your opinion? Uh, it's too general a question. Okay. Um, if it makes sense, um, you know, talk with some experts. So you, you think you think it's so? So we we don't really think about uh, these token launches as ideal funding mechanisms. We think about them as ideal mechanisms uh, for. Uh, doing what we call incentivized mechanism design. Uh, so mechanism design is, uh, uh, is the pursuit where you have system designers um, defining the goals of the system, setting up rules for the system, uh, such that the different selfish actors in the system, according to game theoretic principles, uh, act selfishly uh, and ultimately uh, interact with one another to accomplish the goals of the system. Uh, so these crypto tokens are incredibly valuable for incentivizing that sort of behavior and, and uh, enabling these rules to work. Um, and a really nice side effect is that uh, you can architect your project uh, such that you sell a bunch of these tokens uh, to participants in your system. Uh, and you can use that money uh, indeed to build your project. During the interview, a Bitcoin developer, Jimmy Son, said his term for a recent feud with you. He said that in uh, five years... Recent feud? Yeah, I would say... Do, like, do you call it a feud? <laughs> we're, we're not feuding. Okay, is, what, what's that? Is that a dialogue? So we, yeah, we at, uh, at the consensus event in New York, um, we were on stage together and we decided that we would enter into a bet. We haven't okay, figured okay. out the terms I'm of the sorry. bet. I'm sorry for the definition that Exactly. Um, and yeah, he believed that nothing significant would be built on blockchain systems mm -hmm. except Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That's the, Bitcoin is sort of the, the final word in sophistication for blockchain systems, according to Jimmy. And I said uh, there will be lots of sophisticated systems uh, built on blockchain. Uh, and we have... Uh, to figure out the details of the bet. I'm, I, I kind of <laughs> yeah. figured he'd drop it because it's just so overwhelmingly obvious that sophisticated <laughs> systems will be built. Uh, but then I think he went on Laura Shin's uh, yeah. podcast, yeah, podcast yeah. and I, uh, I was asked to be on it uh, sort of at the last minute and I couldn't make it, but uh, I think we're trying to arrange for Laura to help us negotiate the terms of that. Vitalik was speaking at the, uh, at the tech ranch here uh, earlier, and he said that, and I quote, 
I hope that centralized exchanges would burn in hell as much as possible. So my question is, where do you stand on, exch on crypto exchanges? Mm, so uh, I think that there are lots of different applications that humans need to build. Uh, some of them should be architected, uh, all of them should be architected appropriately and, and centralized systems are um, you know, appropriate architectures for certain applications. Uh, I think what Vitalik's trying to get at is that uh, there are certain vulnerabilities that centralized exchanges have and, and certain, you know, certain ways to take advantage of traders on those exchanges uh, and um, there's also better user experience on those exchanges right now. Um, so you can't do high frequency trading uh, on blockchain systems yet, but I think we're going to get there. So um, uh, I think we should keep adding uh, more decentralized mechanisms into these exchange systems. Um, we can also partition the different trading use cases. So there are lots of people that don't need a high frequency trade executed. They just want to buy a token and hold it for a long time. Um, they should probably use decentralized mechanisms with uh, better pricing mechanisms. Uh, so you can get rid of a lot of the vulnerabilities on those kinds of exchanges, but we still need uh, uh, more efficient architectures for other kinds of traders. Uh, and so hopefully all those applications move into decentralized mechanisms over time when, when the technology can handle it. So are you a crypto a trader yourself? No. No, why I mean, not? I've, I've done, oh, because I work, work for a living. Oh, oh uh, no, I, I mean... Because for... I, I, I work 16 to 20 hours a day and don't have time to day trade. Okay, and but so... But I, I know how... To, yeah, you do know, I know obviously. how to move tokens around. <laughs> yeah. I've done that before. <laughs> okay, and any promising project except, of course, Ethereum and Consensus that you look up to in the industry? Yeah, many. Uh, so many. I mean, we have a lot of projects going on. Uh, so Solarius, Ujo, Uport, Governex... MetaMask, <laughs> the list goes Alethea, on, right? <laughs> Infura, AdChain, yeah, yeah, the list goes on. Okay. Uh, and, and lots of these things are, are coming live too. I mean, um, there's a couple um, high compute um, platforms, Golem, Sonam, uh, iExec, um, a lot of uh, ticketing mechanisms are coming alive. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting year. I, I think um, from here on, uh, we're going to see a lot of deployment uh, of systems that have been under construction for a while uh, on the main chain and a huge number of sort of fun applications that uh, mostly in the gaming space that because uh, uh, it's a safe space to play in. So we're going to see a lot of that uh, at the end of 2018 and into 2019 that uh, uh, will really drive a lot of interest on the network. So I guess there is no point in asking whether you have crypto kitties. Uh, my girlfriend has some crypto kitties, and I have a, a really cool crypto kitties T-shirt. Coin Telegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.